union components, and I'll try to put a little more of a um, teaching spin on it where you should be able to use them afterwards. Um, normally, I just show what they are, not how to use them. But first, who am I? Um, well, I, I worked uh, with MaxDAS the last uh, nine years, and now uh, I'm on the MaxDAS developer team. I had my PhD from uh, University of Copenhagen with Kim Lefman, and now I'm a postdoc at the uh, ESS you know, Management and Software Center. And now uh, I'm being funded by uh, Panosk and Highness European projects. And importantly, I, I write software that I want other people to use. Uh, I want to make something that enhances other people's uh, ability to, to do science and simulations. And my, my first project was called GuideBot. I'm not going to talk about that today. It does uh, optimization of um, guide geometry and will soon have a new version in Python instead. Then the second project was these union components, which allows for modular samples and multiple scattering in MaxDAS. And the latest one uh, is this MaxDAS script, which I will cover uh, at the end of today's session, which uh, allows you to run MaxDAS from Python in a really nice way. So just a, a quick outline for, for the session. First, the union components, then we do some, some questions on those, if there are any. Then I'll do the talk on MaxDAS script, and we'll have questions for that. And then at the very end, we have actually set it up so that uh, you can have a, um, a try uh, of these um, concepts in, in just a browser environment on your own computer without installing anything. So if there's time at the end, we can try that. So my inspiration to, to writing these junior components was actually that when, when we're on a real beam time and see the realistic samples and situations that we have, the simulation had a really tough time dealing with it because it, it might be a sample with some complicated geometry. It might consist of a lot of different materials and there's no clear path to which the neutrons would pass through. Um, the reason is that in MaxDAS, we have one component after another in a sequence and the rays interact with one at a time. And how should we put this sequence here? Does the wire go before, after the sample? Well, it's just not clear. And on top of that, we could have co-aligned crystals, we could have twin crystals, and it could all be in a complex sample environment. And MaxDAS just wasn't ready to really deal with that. So, I, I rethought how should sample description be according to me, and I wanted that to be as modular as possible. And first, the physics should be modular because you want to, to keep that um, simple. So instead of just having one component that does both incoherent and powder, uh, we just have process components. And these are, for example, just incoherent scattering, just powder scattering or just single crystal, maybe phonon or something else. And then you can combine as many of these as you want into a material definition. Um, so on the right, we see a few examples of, of material definitions we could uh, make up in our instrument file. And they also contain a absorption cross-section um, separate from the processes and then we have a full description of what a, a neutron would do in such a material. It has both scattering and absorption cross-section. And of course, scattering is the sum of all possible processes and there's full multiple scattering between them. And the twinning problem, for example, could be solved by just adding two single crystal processes with slightly angled um, crystal lattices. Now, here is a quick example on how you would set up aluminum with incoherent and powder scattering. So first we do the incoherent process component. We insert the incoherent cross-section and the unit cell volume 
then we add a powder process with um, a file that contains all the reflections for aluminum. And that's our two processes. Then we take the union make material component, which is given an absorption. Um, and this absorption is given as an inverse penetration depth in units of one per meter. And at the very end, we tell it, these are the two uh, processes that I want to include in this material. And we just use the names as references in this process string. And then from here on out, AL aluminum refers to this material and we can use that uh, whenever we, we want to make something of aluminum. Now, how do we make some geometry then? Well, uh, it's just constructed from very basic, uh, simpler geometry such as spheres and cylinders, boxes, cones. You can do CAD models. It was provided by a master student called Martin Olsen, but they don't work in conjunction with the others. Then you just assign each material uh, or each geometry is assigned a material rather. So for example, we can grab a cylinder and give it the, the sample material. We can grab and make some, some vacuum around it. We can give it a sample holder of aluminum using a box and we can put a shell around it uh, of, of aluminum too. So it becomes really rather simple to build your geometry. There is however one issue and that is that I want geometries that are allowed to overlap. Usually in MaxTest that creates some nasty errors because it doesn't know the sequencing but that's all taken care of internally in union. But to do that, we have to give each geometry a priority. The higher priority um, will be the one deciding when they overlap. So the priority does not matter when they are separate as here, but if they are overlapping, the region of the overlap is uh, aluminum in this case, because that had the highest priority. And this actually allows us to create some really complex nested geometries with very simple tools. Just imagine you had a, a big chunk of material. You can take out some part internally to make something with a void in it. You can have something going through it, a screw, for example, and you can make weird sized windows and so on, but just placing these simple uh, shapes on top of each other and adjusting the priority accordingly. And so let's see some code. How do we actually do this? Well, let's make a shell of aluminum. First, we take a big drum of aluminum. Uh, here, a radius of 15 centimeters and a height of 40. And we give it some priority. It, they only matter in relation to one another. So we just pick 10 here. And then we say this material is aluminum. Now the, uh, the add and rotated keywords work just like you would expect in MaxDAS. That's how you position this in space uh, and rotate it however you want. Next, we place a vacuum inside of this drum to hollow it out. And that needs to have a higher priority. And of course, a smaller radius and height. It's actually important that no two surfaces uh, are perfectly tangential, otherwise they, um, they, they will sort of break the algorithm. So that's the most common mistake I make with these at the moment. Uh, if I accidentally set the height of these to the same, uh, it breaks down. Then the last bit that's needed to actually perform the simulation is the union master, as Peter mentioned. Because all these previous components that I discussed, they don't actually perform any simulation. They just describe the problem. The union master is just inserted after all of that, and it collects information from all of the previous components and will then just simulate that entire system. This doesn't need any uh, 
inputs in the maxdas instrument file. So it's just, you just put an empty component of union master there, then it will pick it all up. Um, and that's actually what allows me to do multiple scattering between all the geometries because they are effectively simulated as one big component. Here is a, a diagram of a, a, a setup of union components that, that has a, a few materials and a few geometries. Um, you, would, you would start defining your processes and materials, then you would set up your geometries. You can always use vacuum as a material. That's just something that does nothing and that's defined for you. And, and then the master at the end will just pick up all that information. All the solid arrows are connections that you are making yourself. You are telling aluminum that it needs to pick up aluminum incoherent and aluminum powder. And you're telling the cryostat wall that it's made of aluminum, but you don't have to tell the magnet that it needs to be all of the geometries that you've defined so far. And in terms of the order in which you define all of these components, it actually doesn't matter as long as the prerequisites for each um, has been defined. So to define aluminum, you need to define the incoherent and power first but you can, you can define copper after you've defined all the uh, sample holder stuff, for example. So nothing too crazy. Then where does that leave us in terms of um, our previous situation with this sample holder? Well, now we can do something like this. That's just built from cylinders and boxes. And it looks pretty similar. And it will have full multiple scattering between the sample holder. Um, neutrons can go through the wire and um, hit the sample. We can just grab a, a transmission picture of it and see it starts to look like uh, reality. Of course, here I just exaggerated the aluminum cross section so that I got some absorption in there, but um, it's getting to be a little nicer. Now I just want to quickly show how this works in an instrument file, because we have the neutrons going from the source through the guides and so on, and that each of those steps, we go to a new component in the max test file. And that's what I've tried to depict below the horizontal line is that the ray is going from one component to the next. And at some point it goes into this union master and it can actually scatter around in there for quite some time doing as many scattering as it would like. And then at some point it exits and then it's just returned and handed to the next component in the sequence. So nothing really strange there. All that matters is where you place the union master. We can take a look at what's going on inside the union master, because that can't be a straight line as the rest of Max does, because there needs to be multiple scattering between everything. So I've tried to depict each geometry as a circle and connected all of them with lines and then this is sort of the path this ray followed. It moved back and forth between them quite a lot before exiting. The only problem with all of this is that each of these lines is effectively an intersection call where we need to calculate the, uh, the arrival time of the neutron and pick the lowest one to figure out where it will scatter next or where it will hit next. And there's actually um, a network being constructed in the union master that removes all the impossible connections. For example, you can't go from the outside environment straight into the sample. You have to go through the vacuum first. So it removes that connection. And by slowly removing all of those unnecessary connections, 
we end up with a much simpler logical network. And this is the trick that, that um, ends up with much, much faster simulations than otherwise. And so this is still something you can run on your laptop with no problems. This is still uh, relatively fast simulations. Okay, uh, now we have a basic idea about how to use it. Let's have some uh, demonstration. I won't set up the instrument here on your right. That was for another, but, but things like this. You can set up uh, some system with a lot of simple shapes. What I will use for this demonstration is, uh, is a slow buildup of a sample uh, that we actually did an experiment with where I show what we are building on the left and the simulation results on the right. And here we have just made uh, the single crystal tip and we have a five milli electron beam coming in from the left, hitting this little crystal and then a, a banana detector around it, a cylindrical detector. And on the output now, we see there's actually a Bragg peak uh, at around 80 degrees, and then there's some incoherent scattering. It's a time of flight monitor, but the, the results only cover a small time. If we start to add the polychromatic end of the crystal, we don't get much different results because it's actually not in the direct beam. We can start to add the aluminum that holds it to the sample holder, and we should start to see uh, quite weak, but you can see down here uh, a few aluminum brack peaks. We add the, the screws that hold it on, nothing too major. Then this is the, the top of the goniometer, and there's actually a, a few shadows that come up. Um, this is probably because we get another frequent flight path of rays going from the crystal to the goniometer and then to the detector. Adding the, the bulk of the sample holder, we get even more of these clouds and strange um, peaks in our detected signal. Then at the experiment, we actually tried to put some shielding around it to, to avoid this kind of thing. Some um, boronated aluminum, I believe it was. And it does not seem to be enough. We obviously did the simulations after the experiment. We would need another few layers to really stop this problem. Now, there's also the sample stick. How does that actually influence things? And you see a few horizontal lines in, in the uh, data. And that's actually because there's a Bragg peak going almost directly upwards. So that does lead to some scattering from the, the three lower parts of the sample stick. But of course, we need it to be cold. It goes into the cryostat. And that allows for several passes of the beam through different materials and the beam can go back and forth. Five milli electron volts turn out to be an energy where you have quite a lot of backscattering from aluminum, where it's almost uh, two theta of a, uh, 180 degrees. And if we add the, the final drum of the cryostat, there's a lot of different paths the neutrons could take through this system and end up in the detector. And of course, each of those paths have different lengths and different probabilities. And so we end up with this very complex signal. And this could easily be mistaken for all sorts of interesting physics, but there's only powder lines and single crystal elastic scattering here. Nothing inelastic, nothing really interesting. So this is just complexity arising from multiple scattering from a strange geometry that we set up. And it's, it's quite surprising. Of course, you wouldn't see it as much in reality because you would have other types of background and this is on a logarithmic scale. So 
much of this would be hidden in background, but it's still very interesting to understand and use to optimize our future sample environments. Still, we would like to understand how it got to be this bad. And one thing I wanted to figure out was what's the distribution of scattering within the cryostat. And we can actually go take a look. We just view it from above here. And uh, here we plot the scattered intensity as a function of position in our cryostat. And we can see that there is a lot of interesting structure. And so that's the next class of component that I wish to explain. Those are called locker components and they will lock something going on inside of a union master simulation. And they can, they can be set to lock uh, everything that's going on, or they can be attached to certain geometries or processes. If you, for example, want to figure out only what's going on in the aluminum or only in this sample. So they're, they're quite versatile. They can be attached in different ways. Uh, they can do either uh, scattered intensity or absorbed intensity. And that means they can actually also be used to create detectors. Uh, for example, you can just monitor um, the absorption in a helium-3 gas. Then you have uh, a model of a helium-3 detector. And here is uh, the, the image from before in the large size, and we can see the sample in the middle, and we can see a lot of signal, but it's hard to understand exactly what's going on. The code is there in the bottom left, how to set up such a monitor. Um, it's a, a 2D space monitor, two dimensions in space, and we choose um, a direction at a time. We say the, the C and the Y, y direction. Oh. Um, that's a typo on the plot. It should be set an X. And we have um, a range from minus 15 to plus 15 centimeters um, and uh, some, some binning. Then we need to give it a file name. And this just needs to be inserted um, before the master component so that it knows to pick up this information while it's doing the simulation. The loggers can even be told to only look at certain scattering orders. And that's really beneficial when you try to understand these kinds of diagrams. So in the first picture here titled one, we just see the first scattering order. And that of course can only happen in the direct beam. So we see the, the two layers of the cryostat and then the sample. In the next um, picture, number two, we see all of the cryostat illuminated by scattering from those first five points. And we see that that is both some Diaby-Shera cones in the, um, that, that are the big features. And then there are some spots that seem to be um, single crystal Bragg scattering. And in the third picture, we see uh, it's a little more messy, but there's still some, some cones and some circles that we can identify. We can also just task the, the loggers to record the scattering vectors that we see. And that gives us some other very surprising images. Let's again, break it down into the different scattering orders to understand this. For the first order, we actually know the initial wave vector. And that means that the, the total scattering vector at the end has a, a smaller area uh, that it can cover. And that's um, the first scattering that we usually uh, assume is all that's happening in our experiments. And the big circle or, or sphere projected onto the plane really is the incoherent scattering. Then there's the little point which is a Bragg peak from the, the sample. And the two vertical lines 
are actually the powder lines from aluminum. Now in the second, we can cover a much larger area because we have all sorts of initial wave vectors after they were scattered by the, uh, the first step. But the most likely a wave vector is the one that came from a single Bragg scattering in the sample. And so we have a much more, much higher probability of that. So we see another sphere um, in the lower middle part of the diagram. And in this, we even see nice ellipses uh, from the, the powders and aluminum and how they are now projected onto the plane in a different way. We also see lots of speckles of Bragg peaks in the back where other parts of the single crystal sample uh, scatters. And in the third panel, we are, we're back to the original direction because again, the most likely scattering uh, is single crystal from the same planes. And so any uneven number of that will end the neutron in the same direction as it started. But there's also all sorts of other scattering vectors that could be chosen. We can even animate all of that. So this is uh, a few milliseconds of scattering in a cryostat from an instantaneous beam. And we see here the cryostat slowly being illuminated by all the scattering and how all of the multiple scattering goes back and forth in there for quite some time. And we see that the top right is actually the final wave vectors at each time. And the three remaining panels, they are their physical space, scattering in physical space from three different orientations. And if I just grab control of the video, I can narrate some of the important points. Like here is the first time the beam hits the inner part of the cryostat. And we see in final wave vector space that we got uh, a few lines from the aluminum. If we go forward a little bit, the beam hits the sample and we see the, the black spots. And here the beam leaves the inner can. And at the same time, all the incoherent scattering from the sample hits the, the center can and continues to really show the sample environment. As there's nickel in the sample, it has a lot of incoherent. Now the incoherent reaches the outer drum and really illuminates everything. But there's also a Bragg peak going somewhere and creating uh, an exit from this environment. And from that exit generates another set of, uh, of powder rings from the aluminum. So really, uh, it's, it's a huge chaos. We'll just play it from the very start last time. I've never really been able to look at a sample environment the same again after knowing how much is actually going on in there. Again, however, I would argue that this is not sufficient information to actually inform decisions because we need to understand how to eliminate these background problems for a given measurement. What if, say, that spot there at 3.8 milliseconds um, and around 20, 30 degrees is what's obscuring the physics that we want to measure. How would we know what that background, uh, where that originated? Well, that's another type of, of union component that will help us here called a conditional component. And what they do is that they will modify a logger component to only record information 
in case some final condition on the neutron is satisfied. And to target this certain um, direction and time, we just set up a, a little PSD or, or just a little area really that, that covers that interesting time. So we have the original locker that I showed you before, the top component. And then the bottom component is this conditional. And it sets up a size and a time uh, frame. And then it targets this locker called scattering set X. And now this would then be modified to only record anything when the neutron contributes to this specific background problem that we have. There are only two conditional components. One here is the PSD and the other one is just called standard where you can limit energy range and time uh, and so on without a direction. And so if we go back to our problem, we can do a filter like this. Now we just see this little part of the result in our loggers and we can again, view all of the same diagrams as before um, to play detective and figure out where this background was coming from. And if we see the, the spatial distribution of the intensity, it seems to be mainly uh, the sample that the scattering, but let's break it down into scattering orders again. Well, um, the first order could be the sample or any of the walls, it seems. Then the second order, ah, there seemed to be a quite bright spot um, somewhere next to the sample. And, and that's probably part of the issue. The third order, mm, again, the sample is the brightest spot, but that is not so curious as, as a neutron can scatter so many times in a, in a single crystal before leaving. So any odd number of times would be uh, the same direction as, uh, as the incoming beam. Okay, so something with the sample and something with the bright spot next to it is what we learned from these. Then we can look at the scattering vectors that contributed to this background. And that's actually a surprisingly complex plot with only part of a uh, Debussiere cone lit up. Again, if we look at the scattering orders, the first one seems quite clear that it's the sample is, is glowing white where the rest are in, in, in the red colors. And the second order, um, we have that little part of the uh, powder line um, much more white than the other parts. So it seems to be a one single crystal scattering and then one part of, of a powder cone that, that hits our detector. And the third scattering again, um, we, we just see a lot of complexity. And of course, we can make an animation again. This requires a lot of statistics because we need counts for each frame and we need to run enough that we get these, those counts for just those little fraction of rays that contribute to the background problem. But we can do it and we see very little. Here we hit the sample and then we should have something hitting the mounting plate. Here we have a very bright moment and then that's more or less it. That's the only real way that rays can go and hit that part of the background. And if we zoom back or scroll to the, here we were at the sample and we go down to the mounting plate. There we hit it and we can see in the top right corner how it's just part of the powder cone that goes in the direction of the detector and, and how we could now say, okay, we need some shielding in the lower part of our cryostat to prevent this background issue. So um, in summary, 
the uh, the union components clearly allow the simulation of very complex physics and geometry within uh, a normal MaxDAS instrument. And this, this four multiple scattering simulation provides um, a surprising level of detail by just having very simple physics and um, geometry made from just simple shapes. And it's very easy to expand on this because it's also modular. Normally, when you want to make something new in MaxTas, you need to have both the physics and the geometry. Here, you can just make one or the other. And even when you add new physics, you can still get incoherent and single crystal on top of that without having to worry about these things because they, they can be added together. So I hope that this will expand the library of MaxTas samples significantly. And I know that, that this quick talk was not a full tutorial in how to use all of it, but then luckily there is a, a full tutorial available in this um, MaxDash script language in a, in a nice online learning environment. And you can try to have a look at that after the next session. And so that was all for the, uh, the first talk on union components. And I thank you all very much for your attention. And I think we'll have questions on this one now.